So before actually going to what was the main part of the, the actual program, which is the 13 principles of Jewish history, which will answer that question, I think it's important just to have a certain historical background. The second, the second section, the second part of this presentation really is just a quick historical overview. Not a lot of details because that would take too long and probably put most people to sleep. But the, the basic points, the basic ideas to understand what Jewish history is looking for. I mean, here we are, it's the year 5,771. We've been here for a long time. The Jewish people are well over 3,000 years old. We had a chance. We came there to swear with Yeshua. We've been struggling ever since. Korban by Rishon, the first base of Mikdash was destroyed, built by Shlomo Melech, destroyed later on. The second base of Mikdash, Jewish history has, been, has not been a party. There's lots of good times in Baruch Hashem. We have enjoyed probably one of the best periods of history. But overall, it hasn't quite worked out the way it should work out. All the promises of Gula, redemption, things we're waiting for. The amount of suffering we've undergone in the meantime, you have to ask the question, and what, you know, what, what, what's missing? What haven't we done right? If it's, if it's just simply a function of giving, getting everyone to learn Torah and to do mitzvahs, that seems kind of you know, off the grid over here. Even the experts doing Kiruv today are having a tough time just bringing back tens and hundreds and thousands. At the same time, thousands leave the fold, intermarry. 80% assimilation rate, at least over 50% intermarriage rate. People leaving all the time, if not completely, then partially. To make somebody from, to bring a person back into the realm of Torah takes at least a year, if not two years, and maybe many years before they become independent in their own of what is Hashem, their own service of a Kush Baruch Hu. But people leaving every day all the time. So it seems kind of unfair. Not only that, but some of the best learners, some of the people the most devoted with the serious nephers, unheard of in our generation, lived in Europe in the 30s and the 40s. And they were taken too. What does history want? What is the Kodesh Baruch Hu looking for? Is there something missing that we just haven't quite figured out yet? So to get an understanding of what that might possibly be, it's important to look just a little bit, going back to the beginning of Jewish history and see where that takes us until we could finally establish those 13 principles of Jewish history. So the first point to bring out, you know, as much as, as uh, we celebrate every Pesach, Yitzitz Mitzrayim, a wonderful moment in Jewish people, uh, in Jewish history, it's the birth of the Jewish people, the beginning of our existence as a nation. Actually, began a little bit earlier. Paro is the first one to call us a people, but we finally go free. We celebrate that once a year on Pesach. And it's a completely happy moment, except for one problem. That the Chazal tells us, the Medrash tells us, that of the, the, the 15 million Jews living in Mitzrayim, at the time of the Yitzhi, at the time of the Exodus, only one-fifth left. Four-fifths of the Jewish population died in Makas Choshech. One month before the Jewish people actually left Mitzrayim, there was a korban of 12 million Jews. It wasn't done by the Egyptians, wasn't done by the Germans, but it was done however way it happened. Rish Baruch Hu made sure that when the time came for Yitzhi Mitzrayim, only those people who were committed to leave left with Moshe Rabbeinu. So even before the Jewish people began as a nation outside of the land of Egypt, even before we got to a point where we could establish ourselves firmly within the borders of Eretz Israel, already the Jewish people were suffering from some type of lack of understanding, some kind of lack of commitment. Four-fifths, as Rashi brings down, the measures explains the reason for the four-fifths, they stayed behind me shrine, they didn't want to leave. They didn't want to leave. After all these years, of building up Mitzrayim through slavery. And now the Mitzrayim were being killed and being destroyed, and Egypt was becoming kind of a vacuum, political vacuum. Why not stay behind and enjoy the fruits of our labors? Finally, at long last, we'll take over the place. Moshe Bede told, told the Jewish people, no, because Baruch Hu has told us we have to go out. As the Pasuk says, I took you out of Mitzrayim and brought you to Eretz Canaan to be your God. Because Baruch Hu cannot be our God fully into the Jewish people are living in Eretz Canaan, in Eretz Israel. You can't stay behind it. It means Shrine. It's not an option. And if you choose to do so, you won't live there either. So four-fifths dying in Makas Choshech, what kind of gulu could that be? 
Even the people who survived the Holocaust, those who actually were able to endure the camps and get out and, and be saved and be redeemed, when the Americans showed up, whoever saved them, and they were taken out as happy as they were to finally be free of all the torture and suffering, they couldn't really enjoy it. Not then, not a year from then, not the rest of their lives. Remembering the family that was lost, when the four fifths died in Mitzrayim, it wasn't simply all the bad people on one side and all the good people on the other side. It wasn't four fifths of the Rishoyim and one fifth of Siddiquim over here. It was families and friends. And you can just imagine at some point they have the Shabbos table, but the week, because they had Shabbos, the Shabbos table the week before the Gula. Should we leave? Should we leave? Should we leave? Right? Some people saying yes, some people saying no. Yeah, arguing about this thing. Is Moshe really the, the, the Moshe? Is the one to follow? We heard things about him and his brother, his family. You know, they had a discussion taking place. And all of a sudden, the next day, only half the family wakes up. Only half the family appears. Only half the family remains able to go out or friends are disappear. You know, it was a very tough moment. The Medjur doesn't speak about it in detail. The Chumash doesn't even refer to them. But Chlaw. If it wasn't for the Medjur, she wouldn't even know about it. But four fifths, 12 million Jews died in Makas Choshech. It's not starting off on the right foot. There may have been some kind of a you know, cleansing and purging, but it's not what was supposed to have happened. They were authentic Jews. Even more remarkable was that of the three million Jews that went out, three million Arab Rav left with them. Three million Arab were able to leave with Moshe Rabbeinu, but the 12 million Jews, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't find a way to get along and to go along with Moshe Rabbeinu. And, and even though we, you know, the one-fifth goes out, the story's not over yet. Still disaster. The Jewish people, they go to Har Sinai. Because Baruch Hu gives the Torah to them. What happens in the end? The Egel Zahab, the golden calf. What's the result of the golden calf? Moshe Rabbeinu comes down from Har Sinai. He sees what's taking place in the camp below. And he, he breaks the Luchas Rishonas. He breaks the first tablets. Okay, you know, he gets a second set later on. Apparently there was a guarantee. He could somehow you know, work it out, replace them. But it wasn't the same thing. The second set it came down with were the ones that he himself carved out. He actually carved at the luchas. Kosh Baruch wrote on them, but he carved at the luchas. The first set of luchas he came down with were carved up by Kosh Baruch as well. Hashem carved them out, and Kosh Baruch wrote on them. So aside from that difference, like you know, you know what, you know what, what difference was there? Okay, so it wasn't as special. So Kabbalah explains it was a whole different reality. Had Moshe Benu came come down with the first set of tablets, the first luchos, that would have been the beginning of Yemos Mashiach right then and there. That would have brought an end to history. All the history, the Leshem explains all the history, all the negative history especially, that happened from that point onward, had it not been the golden calf and the breaking of the tablets, it wouldn't have taken place. All the disasters, all the pogroms, all the blood libels, the Holocaust, all the negative history that happened since that moment in time wouldn't have occurred. Because bringing down the first set of the first set of tapas, the luchas rishonas, would have would have ushered in the era of Yemosa Mashiach right then. So already, you know, things are are transforming. Already, history is going down the wrong path. Things aren't quite working out the way Kosh Bohu planned them, or the way we thought he planned them in the end. And it's one disaster after the other. The Jewish people go in the midbar after recovering Kosh Bohu, He forgives the Jewish people. Moshe Benu spends 80 days in Har Sinai, davening for the, for the tshuva, davening for the kapara. Kosh Baruch finally says, fine, okay, go ahead. We'll only kill the people responsible, and the Jewish people go on. And they keep making more mistakes, and another mistake, until finally, they even go so far as to reject Eretz Yisrael. Reject Eretz Yisrael, you know, Kosh Baruch says, that's it. Ten times you tested me in the midbar, that's, that's the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's not going to work from this point onward. I mean, 40 years in the midbar. 40 years, you're going to sit here, you're going to think about what happened, you know, until everybody responsible who's involved in this chet, of the, of the spies, of the maraglim, they die off. So fine through 40 years, Jewish people get to the board of Everett's Canaan, perhaps at this point in time to rectify what's gone wrong, to finally make amends and, and start anew. Under Yeshua bin Nun, we lost Moshe bin because of the chet, of Memeriva, so, but maybe this is the beginning. Finally, we're going to cross the border to Israel, and the Grah brings down that had 600,000 male Jews, based on the Zohar, 
600,000 male Jews crossed the Yardane into Eretz Israel at one time to take the land, to fight for the land, and to live in the land. That would have neutralized the Sitra Achra completely, and that would have also ushered in Yemosa Mashiach. So what happens instead? It's incredible. B'nai Reuven, B'nai Menashe, B'nai Gavit, B'nai, B'nai Menashe, they come to Moshe Ben and they say, you know, we were thinking that it's nice over here in, in the diaspora. It's nice in Chutzlart. It's nice in Avahar Yardin. We have a lot of cattle. This is good cattle land. I mean, today I don't know, what, you know, today it's all desert, right? But back then I guess there was a lot of grass. This is a great place to raise our cattle. Would you mind if we don't cross the border and live in Israel? And Moshe can't believe it because he lives with the entire thing. Do you understand that this is exactly what your ancestors did in the past? That that's the reason why we're spending 40 years in the midbar but until now they've been dying off every tissue but they've been dying, burying, you know, digging themselves graves and burying themselves inside them. And, and, you know, and that's why we're here after all this time and you're asking to live in chutzlats? Because Baruch says to Moshe Beinu, don't take it personally. It's a rejection of me, not a rejection of you. And the Medrash says, the Medrash says on this particular point, the moment that they asked for Avah Yardin, right? The moment they, they, they took that part of the land, that was the beginning of Gullah's bubble. And that's why the first tribes to be exiled later on are Bnei Reuven, Bnei Gad, Bnei Menashe. They're the ones, Reuven, Gad, Menashe. They get exiled to Syria first, and later on comes Yehuda. And there's Churban Bais Rishon, the destruction of the first base of Mitzvah. We build another one, and that's destroyed. And from that point on, 2,000 years of history. 2,000 years of, of what? Pogroms, blood libels, murdering Jews. The Ziva Zohar speaks about the 1800s. In Europe, probably around, I think, Poland, he says, you know, in his time, they thought you know, it must be Chedli Mashiach, he said, because the amount of blood, Jewish blood being spilled, like almost up to your knees type of a thing, you know, if it's really, you know, physical or just you know, metaphorically speaking, but so much blood that's being spilled of Klai Yisrael, it's got to be Chedli Mashiach. And that was the 1800s. And he hadn't seen the Holocaust yet. That's Jewish history. But what about all the learning? What about all the, all the mysterious nefesh? What about all the stories of people who were taken to their deaths and they stood by Kodesh Baruch until the very last moment? They died that way. They lived from this world, they went to the next world, right? They, they didn't capitulate whatsoever. And the learning that was done in Europe and all through history and the misses that were being performed, what about all that? What, what do we have to do? Is, is the game fixed? Are the cards fixed over here? It's basically, we're stuck. There's always four fifths, and we're always going to have to wait until the very last second before Mashiach finally arrives. What, you know, what's missing from Jewish history? What do we have to do? What do we have to do today, specifically, to try to mitigate the situation and soften the blow of anti-Semitism, perhaps raise it completely? Because as we sit here tonight, history is evolving. And it's evolving in a way that's not exactly the way we would have things go. It's changing changing the status of the Jewish people in the eyes of the world. It was a very interesting medrash. And it's amazing, you know, you know, in a sense, there's nothing new about anything I'm telling you tonight. It's all based upon Makaris and sources. Some of the history might be new, but it's all there, basically. All we do is weave things together. We can't make up new sources. That's not our job. The Torah was given. We have the, we have the, we have the Gemara to explain things in Medrashim. Tanakh is the basis of everything. You have Roshon Achronim. We don't make up new sources over here. Kabbalah perhaps came along later on and provided some insights we didn't have previously or only were unique to certain people. But for the most part, all we're doing is pulling together all the sources from all over and making a bag. We're weaving them together into a cohesive and coherent fabric that we can stand back and say, that's what's going on over here. It's an incredible medrash. It's a famous medrash. But it's the parish in the Medrash that makes the difference. The Medrash is from a Gemara in Baba Basra. A whole bunch of Gemaras, a Rebbe Barachana, Mashalim, Maisim, the true, not true. One of them basically is he and some friends, some colleagues, they are sailing on a ship. They get to what they think is an island. So they get out of the boat. And they you know, go down onto the island. And what do you do in an island? You start to cook and bake. 
light a fire, right? Get things, get things moving over here. Feed yourselves. They do that. And all of a sudden, they realize it's not an island. What is it? It's a big, huge fish. Whale, whatever, you know, somehow it looks like an island. You know, even a whale doesn't quite look like an island, but okay. They got somehow found some kind of a huge fish. Maybe it's the Leviathan. Who knows? Monstrous fish that looks like an island, and they're cooking and they're baking, and this thing begins to turn over. So it turns over, and they're thrown to the water. And the manager concludes by saying, if the boat had not been close by, all of us would have drowned. Yeah, okay, nice story. Must be some kind of nimshol, some kind of musar haskel to take out of this. Rabbeinu Yaakov, in the 1800s, explaining this medrash, says that Rabbi Barachana was having, it was Rucha Kodesh. He wasn't talking stum about some incident that took place at sea. He was talking about the Jewish people, about Tzia at the end of history. The time of Yemus and Mashiach. And he says, you know what's going to happen? At that time, he's writing in the 1800s. This is before the Jewish people could even conceive of getting back to the land, let alone controlling the land. It was a fantasy at that point in time. And he says that the Jewish people, at the end of history, they will have the land of Israel, but on top of that, they will have control over a people in the land. They will control a people. And the Jewish people will think that this people they're ruling over has no way to rebel or get out of the situation. That they'll always be under the Jewish control. So therefore the Jewish people will not treat them exactly the way they should, the way they ought to. And this people at some point in time will turn the plate over on its mouth. That's the Lashon of the Medrash, of the parish. Meaning what? Because the Gemara uses a Lashon like that, talking about Eov. Turns the whole situation around. Flip-flop the entire thing, just like that. And the Medrash says, what's the boat? Or the, what's the, the, the Yaakov says, what's the boat? The boat is Mashiach. If Mashiach is close at hand, we'll be okay. But if he's not close at hand, we will drown from the problems this people create for us. That's what the Medrash says. You know, if you read this Medrash 25 years ago, 30 years ago, 100 years ago, it wouldn't have made sense. But incredible. I mean, to, to imagine, it's one thing to predict the Jewish people will be back in their land at the end of history. That's how talk. It's a promise. He made that promise to us. As if you believe it, you believe it. But to assume, to predict, we're going to control a people, already it's taking a step in the, you know, in, in the realm of taking a chance that you might be wrong. But to go one step further and two steps further and saying that only will we control those people, but we will misuse these people and abuse these people, and they will flip the situation around. I mean, 1987, until that time, the Jewish people were David. We were David, a melech. And the Palestinians, the Palestinians, whatever, the Arabs, they were, they were Goliath, they were Goliath. The reason why Goliath sounds like Galus, they were Goliath. What happens? They pick up some stones, and CNN catches it on television. They throw these stones at the Jewish people, at the, at the army. It's all fixed photography, and all, it's all you know, photo opportunities. And somehow the, the whole thing flip-flops. We become the Goliath, and they become the David. The world looks at them as if they're the underdog, they're the David, they're the ones who are correct in fighting the ones they're supposed to fight, and we are the bad guys over here, even though all that we're doing is defending ourselves in the land that belongs to us. Total flip-flop, just like the Medrash predicted. Well, that's remarkable. You can't take that one lightly. The Chlal. So why does it happen if that's the case? Obviously, history is waiting for something. It's waiting for something. And for three millennia, until this very day, we haven't answered the question. We haven't provided history with what it needs. Could be we have no choice. Could be that there's this you know, play, you know, Kush Bolch has written the script and it's just acting itself out, and we're, our job is basically just to do the best we can, given the circumstances, the parameters, but the Gemara says not like that. The Gemara says, Zecha, Achishena, lo zoicha b'ita. Right? If we're zoicha, we do something. Somehow, we can be zoicha. Is zoicha only bring everyone back into tshuva? For sure. If it was possible to bring ever the majority of Kalei Yisrael back to Torah mitzvahs, more than likely, that would solve the problem. 
but that's not going to happen so quickly. It certainly hasn't happened until now. Not without some kind of major miracle. So the side point, it's an interesting thing. I have a friend who lives uh, in northern Israel. Uh, he himself is you know, not so dati at this point in time, and he's certainly working towards it. A, you know, but he's very much into what's going on historically. We always schmooze about the events of today, and he can see how history is unfolding and where it's going, and it concerns him you know, tremendously. His wife, Bichlau, is not into this idea, and his kids, for sure, are way, they're total, completely secular Israelis, with no, no eye of the future whatsoever. And their activities are exactly like that. He's called up people in the past, what do I do about this, what do I do about that, you know? Because he wants to have, like, you know, he wants to have a Hamish home, wants to have, like, a, 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 a traditional home, you know? But his kids, completely the other direction. And this way, he writes me, he says, he says, what do you think is going to happen? My daughter came home. This Friday night, she wanted to go to shul. She wanted to double in shul. She never talks about going to shul. And why? Because all of her friends, who normally, you know, they're smoking chukah and they're doing all these like, secular activities, they're all praying all of a sudden. You know, I understand what's going on over here. Why? Because they're all talking about the war of Gog and Magog. And they think it's imminent. It's like, you know, I can't convince people who believe in this stuff to think like that. And they come home you know, totally secular, and this is their life, they're thinking like they're, it's imminent, and they want to pray. So Zohar says that one of the simani, the Mashiach is not so far away, very close, is that when children, it becomes so obvious on a level that even children start to ask the question, do you think it's the war of God of God coming? Are we that close at this point in time? Children love dafka little kids. It could be people who are also who are adults who don't, you know, as Gamora points out, they're not so familiar with, you know, with, with Yiddish kind and things like that. There's, and they can see it, they can talk about these things. That means something. 